The Call of Cthulhu by H.P. Lovecraft. One, the horror in clay. The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. Theosophists have guessed at the awesome grandeur of the cosmic cycle wherein our world and human race form transient incidents. They have hinted at strange survivals in terms which would freeze the blood if not masked by bland optimism. But it is not from them that there came the single glimpse of forbidden eons which chills me when I think of it and maddens me when I dream of it. That glimpse, like all dread glimpses of truth, flashed out from an accidental piecing together of separated things. In this case, an old newspaper item and the notes of a dead professor. I hope that no one else will accomplish this piecing out. Certainly, if I live, I shall never knowingly supply a link in so hideous a chain. I think that the professor, too, intended to keep silent regarding the part he knew, and that he would have destroyed his notes had not sudden death seized him. The professor had been stricken whilst returning from the Newport boat, falling suddenly, as witnesses said, after having been jostled on the precipitous hillside which formed a shortcut from the waterfront to the deceased's home in Williams Street. Physicians were unable to find any visible disorder but concluded after perplexed debate that some obscure lesion of the heart, induced by the brisk ascent of so steep a hill by so elderly a man, was responsible for the end. As my great uncle's heir and executor, for he died a childless widower, I was expected to go over his papers with some thoroughness. There was one box which I found exceedingly puzzling, and which I felt much averse from showing to other eyes. The bas-relief was a rough rectangle less than an inch thick and about five by six inches in area, obviously of modern origin. Its designs, however, were far from modern in atmosphere and suggestion, for although the vagaries of cubism and futurism are many and wild, they do not often reproduce that cryptic regularity which lurks in prehistoric writing. The writing accompanying this oddity was, aside from a stack of press cuttings, in Professor Angel's most recent hand, and made no pretense to literary style. What seemed to be the main document was headed Cthulhu Cult, in characters painstakingly printed to avoid the erroneous reading of a word so unheard of. The first half of the principal manuscript told a very particular tale. It appears that on March 1st, 1925, a thin, dark young man of neurotic and excited aspect had called upon Professor Angel bearing the singular clay bas-relief, which was then exceedingly damp and fresh. His card bore the name of Henry Anthony Wilcox, and my uncle had recognized him as the youngest son of an excellent family slightly known to him. On the occasion of the visit, ran the professor's manuscript, the sculptor abruptly asked for the benefit of his host's archaeological knowledge in identifying the hieroglyphics of the bas-relief, and my uncle showed some sharpness in replying, for the conspicuous freshness of the tablet implied kinship with anything but archaeology. Young Wilcox's rejoinder, which impressed my uncle enough to make him recall and record it verbatim, was of a fantastically poetic cast which must have typified his whole conversation, and which I have since found highly characteristic of him. He said, 
It is new indeed, for I made it last night in a dream of strange cities. Upon retiring, he had had an unprecedented dream of great cyclopean cities of titan blocks and sky-flung monoliths, all dripping with green ooze and sinister with latent horror. Hieroglyphics had covered the walls and pillars, and from some undetermined point below had come a voice that was not a voice, a chaotic sensation which only fancy could transmute into sound, but which he attempted to render by the almost unpronounceable jumble of letters C-T-H-U-L-H-U F-H-T-A-G-N. On March 23rd, the manuscript continued, Wilcox failed to appear, and inquiries at his quarters revealed that he had been stricken with an obscure sort of fever and taken to the home of his family in Waterman Street. He had cried out in the night, arousing several other artists in the building, and had manifested since then only alternations of unconsciousness and delirium. On April 2, at about 3 p.m., every trace of Wilcox's malady suddenly ceased. He sat upright in bed, astonished to find himself at home, and completely ignorant of what had happened in dream or reality since the night of March 22nd. My uncle, it seems, had quickly instituted a prodigiously far-flung body of inquiries amongst nearly all the friends whom he could question without impertinence, asking for nightly reports of their dreams and the dates of any notable visions for some time past. The reception of his request seems to have been varied, but he must at the very least have received more responses than any ordinary man could have handled without a secretary. Scientific men were little more affected, though four cases of vague description suggest fugitive glimpses of strange landscapes, and in one case, there is mentioned a dread of something abnormal. One case, which the note describes with emphasis, was very sad. The subject, a widely known architect with leanings toward theosophy and occultism, went violently insane on the date of young Wilcox's seizure and expired several months later after incessant screamings to be saved from some escaped denizen of hell. Here was a nocturnal suicide in London where a lone sleeper had leaped from a window after a shocking cry. And so numerous are the recorded troubles in insane asylums that only a miracle can have stopped the medical fraternity from noting strange parallelisms and drawing mystified conclusions. Two, the tale of Inspector Legrasse. Once before, it appears, Professor Angel had seen the hellish outlines of the nameless monstrosity and heard the ominous syllables which can be rendered only as Cthulhu. This earlier experience had come in 1908, 17 years before, when the American Archaeological Society held its annual meeting in St. Louis. The chief of these outsiders, John Raymond Legrasse, and he was by profession an inspector of police. With him he bore the subject of his visit. It must not be fancied that Inspector Legrasse had the least interest in archaeology. On the contrary, his wish for enlightenment was prompted by purely professional considerations. The statuette, idol, fetish, or whatever it was, had been captured some months before in the wooded swamps south of New Orleans during a raid on a supposed voodoo meeting. One sight of the thing had been enough to throw the assembled men of science into a state of tense excitement, and they lost no time in crowding around him to gaze at the diminutive figure whose utter strangeness and air of genuinely abysmal antiquity hinted so potently at unopened and archaic vistas. And yet, as the members severally shook their heads and confessed defeat at the inspector's problem, 
There was one man in that gathering who suspected a touch of bizarre familiarity in the monstrous shape and writing, and who presently told with some diffidence of the odd trifle he knew. This person was the late William Channing Webb, professor of anthropology in Princeton University, and an explorer of no slight note. Professor Webb had been engaged, 48 years before, in a tour of Greenland and Iceland in search of some runic inscriptions which he failed to unearth, and whilst high up on the West Greenland coast had encountered a singular tribe or cult of Eskimo, whose religion, a curious form of devil worship, killed him with its deliberate bloodthirstiness and repulsiveness. Besides nameless rites and human sacrifices, there were certain queer hereditary rituals addressed to a supreme elder devil, or Tornasuk. And of this, Professor Webb had taken a careful phonetic copy from an aged Angekok, or wizard priest, expressing the sounds in Roman letters as best he knew how. There then followed an exhaustive comparison of details, and a moment of really awed silence when both detective and scientist agreed on the virtual identity of the phrase common to two hellish rituals so many worlds of distance apart. What, in substance, both the Eskimo wizards and the Louisiana swamp priests had chanted to their kindred idols was something very like this, the word divisions being guessed at from traditional breaks in the phrase as chanted aloud. Fonglui. Mogalunath, Cthulhu, Rolye, Uganagal, Vatagan. In his house at Rulye, dead Cthulhu waits, dreaming. And now, in response to a general and urgent demand, Inspector Legrasse related as fully as possible his experience with the swamp worshippers. On November 1st, 1907, there had come to the New Orleans police a frantic summons from the swamp and lagoon country to the south. There were insane shouts and harrowing screams, soul-chilling chants and dancing devil flames. The muffled beat of tom-toms was faintly audible far, far ahead, and a curdling shriek came at infrequent intervals when the wind shifted. A reddish glare, too, seemed to filter through the pale undergrowth beyond the endless avenues of forest night. Animal fury and orgiastic license here whipped themselves to demoniac heights by howls and squawking ecstasies that tore and reverberated through those nighted woods like pestilential tempests from the gulfs of hell. Now and then, the less organized ululation would cease. and from what seemed a well-drilled chorus of hoarse voices would rise in sing-song chant that hideous phrase or ritual. For Glui, Mogaluna, Cthulhu, Rolye, Wuganago, Vatagen. And although there must have been nearly a hundred mongrel celebrants in the throng, the police relied on their firearms and plunged determinedly into the nauseous rout. For five minutes, the resultant din and chaos were beyond description. They worshipped, so they said, the great old ones who lived ages before there were any men, and who came to the young world out of the sky. Those old ones were gone now, inside the earth and under the sea, but their dead bodies had told their secrets in dreams to the first men, who formed a cult which had never died. This was that cult, and the prisoners said it had always existed and always would exist. The carven idol was Great Cthulhu. Someday he would call, when the stars were ready, and the secret cult would always be waiting to liberate him. No one could read the old writing now, but things were told by word of mouth. The chanted ritual was not the secret, that was never spoken aloud, only whispered. The chant meant only this. In his house at Rulye, dead Cthulhu waits dreaming. 
That my uncle was excited by the tale of the sculptor, I did not wonder, for what thoughts must arise upon hearing, after a knowledge of what Legrasse had learned of the cult, of a sensitive young man who had dreamed not only the figure and exact hieroglyphics of the swamp-bound image and the Greenland devil tablet, but had come in his dreams upon at least three of the precise words of the formula uttered alike by Eskimo diabolists and mongrel Louisianans. One thing I began to suspect, and which I now fear I know, is that my uncle's death was far from natural. Might not the deeper inquiries of my uncle after encountering the sculptor's data have come to sinister ears? I think Professor Angel died because he knew too much, or because he was likely to learn too much. Whether I shall go as he did remains to be seen, for I have learned much now. Three. The Madness from the Sea If heaven ever wishes to grant me a boon, it will be a total effacing of the results of a mere chance which fixed my eye upon a certain stray piece of shelf paper. It read as follows. Mystery derelict found at sea. Vigilant arrives with helpless armed New Zealand yacht in tow. One survivor and dead man found aboard. Tale of desperate battle and deaths at sea. Rescued seaman refuses particulars of strange experience. Odd idol found in his possession. The living man was clutching a horrible stone idol of unknown origin, about a foot in height. This was all, together with the picture of the hellish image. But what a train of ideas it started in my mind. Here were new treasuries of data on the Cthulhu cult and evidence that it had strange interests at sea as well as on land. The Emma, he says, was delayed and thrown widely south of her course by the great storm of March 1st, and on March 22nd encountered the Alert, manned by a queer and evil-looking crew of Kanakas and half-castes. Being ordered peremptorily to turn back, Captain Collins refused, whereupon the strange crew began to fire savagely and without warning upon the schooner with a peculiarly heavy battery of brass cannon. The Emma's men showed fight. They managed to heave alongside their enemy and board her, grappling with the savage crew on the yacht's deck and being forced to kill them all. Three of the Emma's men, including Captain Collins and First Mate Green, were killed. The next day, it appears, they raised and landed on a small island although none is known to exist in that part of the ocean. Shaken with such a mental revolution as I had never before known, I now resolved to visit mate Johansen in Oslo. A sad-faced woman in black answered my summons, and I was stung by disappointment when she told me in halting English that Gustav Johansen was no more. He had not long survived his return, said his wife, for the doings at sea in 1925 had broken him. Persuading the widow that my connection with her husband's technical matters was sufficient to entitle me to his manuscript, I bore the document away and began to read it on the London boat. It was a simple, rambling thing, a native sailor's effort at a post facto diary, and strove to recall day by day that last awful voyage. Driven ahead by curiosity in their captured yacht under Johansen's command, the men sight a great stone pillar sticking out of the sea, a nightmare corpse city of Rulhier. Awe at the unbelievable size of the greenish stone blocks, at the dizzying height of the great carbon monolith, and at the stupefying identity of the colossal statues and bas-reliefs, with the queer image found in the shrine on the alert, is poignantly visible in every line of the mate's frightened description. Johansen and his men landed at a sloping mud bank on this monstrous acropolis, 
and clambered slipperily up over Titan oozy blocks which could have been no mortal staircase. As Wilcox would have said, the geometry of the place was all wrong. One could not be sure that the sea and the ground were horizontal, hence the relative position of everything else seemed phantasmally variable. Ryden pushed at the stone in several places, and the men wondered how any door in the universe could be so vast. Then, very softly and slowly, the acre-great lintel began to give inward at the top, and everyone watched the queer recession of the monstrously carven portal. In this fantasy of prismatic distortion, it moved anomalously in a diagonal way, so that all rules of matter and perspective seemed upset. The odor rising from the newly opened depths was intolerable, and at length the quick-eared Hawkins thought he heard a nasty, slopping sound down there. Everyone listened, and everyone was listening still when it lumbered slobberingly into sight and gropingly squeezed its gelatinous green immensity through the black doorway into the tainted outside air of that poison city of madness. Poor Johansson's handwriting almost gave out when he wrote of this. Of the six men who never reached the ship, he thinks, too, perished of pure fright in that accursed instant. The thing cannot be described. There is no language for such abysms of shrieking and immemorial lunacy, such eldritch contradictions of all matter, force, and cosmic order. A mountain walked or stumbled. God! What wonder that across the earth the great architect went mad and poor Wilcox raved with fever in that telepathic instant. The thing of the idols, the green, sticky spawn of the stars, had awakened to claim its own. The stars were right again, and what an age-old cult had failed to do by design, the band of innocent sailors had done by accident. After vigintillions of years, great Cthulhu was loose again and ravening for delight. Three men were swept up by the flabby claws before anybody turned. Parker slipped as the other three were plunging frenziedly over endless vistas of green-crusted rock to the boat, and Johansson swears he was swallowed up by an angle of masonry which shouldn't have been there, an angle which was acute but behaved as if it were obtuse. So only Bryden and Johansson reached the boat and pulled desperately for the alert as the mountainous monstrosity flopped down the slimy stones and hesitated, floundering at the edge of the water. There was a mighty eddying and foaming in the noisome brine, and as the steam mounted higher and higher, the brave Norwegian drove his vessel head-on against the pursuing jelly which rose above the unclean froth like the stern of a demon galleon. There was a bursting as of an exploding bladder, a slushy nastiness as of a cloven sunfish, a stench as of a thousand opened graves, and a sound that the chronicler could not put on paper. For an instant the ship was befouled by an acrid and blinding green cloud, and there was only a venomous seething astern where, God in heaven, the scattered plasticity of that nameless sky spawn was nebulously recombining in its hateful original form, whilst its distance widened every second as the alert gained impetus from its mounting steam. That was all. After that, Johansson only brooded over the idol in the cabin and attended to a few matters of food for himself and the lapping maniac by his side. He did not try to navigate after the first bold flight, for the reaction had taken something out of his soul. That was the document I read, and now I have placed it in the tin box beside the bas-relief in the papers of Professor Angel. With it shall go this record of mine, this test of my own sanity, wherein is pieced together that which I hope may never be pieced together again. 
I have looked upon all that the universe has to hold of horror. And even the skies of spring and the flowers of summer must ever afterward be poison to me. But I do not think my life will be long. As my uncle went, as poor Johansson went, so I shall go. I know too much. And the cult still lives. Cthulhu still lives too, I suppose. Again in that chasm of stone which has shielded him since the sun was young. His accursed city is sunken once more, for the vigilant sailed over the spot after the April storm, but his ministers on earth still bellow and prance and slay around idle-capped monoliths in lonely places. He must have been trapped by the sinking whilst within his black abyss, or else the world would by now be screaming with fright and frenzy. Who knows the end? What has risen may sink, and what has sunk may rise. Loathsomeness waits, and dreams in the deep, and decay spreads over the tottering cities of men. A time will come, but I must not and cannot think. Let me pray that... If I do not survive this manuscript, my executors may put caution before audacity and see that it meets no other eye.